Well, Bobby, thank you for being on Uncut and Real Rule. Clinton, thanks for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be here, and uh, I've been excited about this ever well, since you me, called me. me too. So for people who don't my, know my guest, this is Bobby Smith. Bobby, we've known each other now for probably at least 20 years, to be honest. Wouldn't yeah. you say that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We go back to Sterling, Illinois. Yes, the Double G Equestrian <laughs> Center for people that remember that. That was my first real gig when I kind of became a clinician that I got to go there and film my TV shows there on RFD TV. It would have been around 2000, 2001. And it's going back a, a while now, that's for sure. Well, Bobby, the reason I wanted you on the show is for several reasons, is that you have a lot of horsemanship background that I want to dive into with back in the days when you were running around with my mentor and our great friend, Doug Carpenter. But then at some point you changed to the business world. And I'm always intrigued what makes people change industry. When I say industries, I suppose it was, even though it's still equine related, what you do now, but it went from training horses and showing to the business world. And that's always, anytime mm -hmm. somebody changes industries, I always like to know why they did it. What gave them the leap of faith? My mentor and our great friend, Doug Carpenter, he passed away of COVID a couple of years ago. And, and one of the things I remember from him, I used to love listening to his stories is, is he's, you know, he said, Clinton, I used to be a horse trainer. And he said, you know, I'd won several AQHA world championships and Western pleasure, Western riding, et cetera. And he said, uh, one day I walked down through my barn and he said, I had 13 head of horses in training. And he said, honestly, like 11 of them were just pisses of shit. That's just <laughs> what they were. They were just shitty horses. <clears throat> and the two that were great ones, he said, I had bought them with my own money and I owned them. And he said, what the hell am I doing this for? I'm working my ass off. I'm not making any real money. And he said, he said, Clinton, he said, that night I walked in the house. He said, I told everybody to come pick up their horse. And he said, I had two horses left in the barn. And I said, well, Doug, I said, what are you going to do? He said, I decided to be a broker. I was going to sell high-end Western performance horses, pleasure horses, halter horses, reining horses, but on a high level. And I said to him, I said, well, when you jump ship, did you have customers? Did you have people already lined up to buy these two head of horses? He said, nothing. He said, I had two little kids, a wife, and a mortgage, and I'm broke. And I said, Doug, that took some balls to recognize what you're doing is not working, but just to jump. And he said something to me, he said, Clinton, when you jump like that, it makes you work even harder. There is no plan B. You got to swim to the beach. There is no lifeline. So I always, I always got off on listening to people having the balls and the guts to just jump. And, you know, when he did that, he made a lot more money, obviously. And, he, you know, Doug's bought and sold more fertility champions and reigning and working cow horse than anybody in the business. And we'll get into it later. But that's kind of why I want to dig into you a little bit, because you jumped as well. And I always like to know what makes people jump industries for what reason and things like that. So, Bobby, let's go back. Well, first of all, just to clarify where we're at now, I've lost track of you a little bit in the business world, meaning that You've been involved with Cinch for many years, okay? But you had different roles in that company all over the years. Would you agree with that? Uh, absolutely. What is your role now and what are you doing now? We'll just start there. What's your job now? And then we're going to back up to an 18-year-old Bobby. Yes. Uh, I've been with uh, Miller International. Yeah, Miller International. Company. It was the yep. parent company, uh, yes. 20, 25 years. Okay. And uh, I was a sales rep on the road covering Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio and uh, represented all of their brands for uh, 10, 12 years on the road. Yep. Um, we changed ownership in 07. And the new owner, uh, I had met, he was our, our CFO. Yep. And he was wondering, we, we sort of had some challenges in the design and manufacturing area. Mm -hmm. Which there's always gonna be. There's always gonna be. Yep. And um, they approached me and said, would you be interested in coming off of the road, yep. moving to Denver, and be over the product development and design of Cinch. Mm -hmm. And after 22 years on the road, you were ready. I was ready. Yeah. And and while that was a difficult jump mm -hmm. and decision to make, because mm -hmm. I mean, we, my wife and I, Kelly, we'd built a place in Illinois. I thought I'd die there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Raised our kids, went mm -hmm. to school. So that was a big move. Yeah. And I had built a very successful repping business. Very much so. It, and in ba and back in those, I don't know if it's still the same way, but back in those days, Bobby, if you built a very successful business, that was a good chunk of change there. Well, you know what I'm trying to say? You worked your ass off and you were a carny. Yeah. People don't realize how much 
you're living out of a suitcase. Oh my God. You're like Joe Dirt living on the road. Absolutely. Living out of a suitcase. I, I, I was, well, and the big thing to me was I was an independent rep. I represented seven great lines. Mm -hmm. I had to get fired seven times. <laughs> To be unemployed. Yes. So, so to go from that position yes. to a position to where I only had to be fired once. <laughs> you think about that. Yeah, that's true. That is true. Right. So, so what is your? So, are you still so, in that position so, now? So, no. I, I did that for about five years. Yeah. And uh, every every boot company in the industry had approached us to build a cinch boot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I I talked our owner into just kind of being patient. And I said, when the right opportunity comes along. I think we should do it ourselves, and if the opportunity never happens, yes. no problem. And the opportunity for Rod Patrick Bootmakers mm -hmm. uh, come along to purchase. Um, Rod Patrick was yes. looking for an exit strategy. Yes, and, uh, and, it was and we a hell bought of a boot. it. A hell of a boot, hell of a product, and uh, still is. I yes. mean, it's it's a wonderful, wonderful. And and I really love the boot business as an independent rep. I'd repped uh, the Lucchese boot line uh -huh. for about seven years. Yeah, uh, was very close with the designer there. So I had a, I had a real love for boots. Yes. And uh, when we acquired that, I kind of raised my hand and mm -hmm. said two things. I said, I think we should leave our boot company in Texas because we're based in Denver. Mm -hmm. And he asked me, my, he asked, says, when are you moving? Mm -hmm. So I, I moved. And so my current title is I am president of Rod Patrick Boots, vice president of Cinch Jeans. Okay, very good. So you kind of got two hats going on. Yes, right? yes. Okay. And right. I tell everybody I'm sort of involved with Cinch at a 30,000 foot yeah. level and just yeah. you know troubleshoot some things from time yep. to time etc yep. yep okay well that's a good place to get started where you are now but i kind of want to go right back to the beginning because you've got some old school stuff that i want to dig into because i always loved uh, most of my life i've always been attracted to older people than me just like doug 20 25 year old more older than me you know and i think i was attracted to him because I love their wisdom, mm -hmm. I love their knowledge, but more than anything, I love their stories about oh. how it used to be and Absolutely. what they used to have to do. And I was just very always intrigued. You know, I could listen to Doug's stories all day long and you, and, and that's why I wanna dive into some of your stories as well. So let's back up a little bit. So you were born and raised in Illinois? Yep, uh, corn and soybean farm. Um, so parents are farmers? Farmers, yeah. Uh, my mother was uh, very intelligent. Uh, she read all the time, that's all she did was read. Uh, she would read these books on horses and then she would tell my father what she learned from the books. Then my father would communicate that to me. So back up a little bit. You're a horse family, you're farmers, but we're, who, we're horse, who, was the, who was the horse passion person? My mother. Your mother. She had horses she and had, she loved them. Yes, loved them. Loved mm -hmm. them. I cannot remember not having horses. Okay. So she, she introduced them to the kids and got the kids right. Yes. Yes. And, and back in that day, you know, there was every county fair, every weekend in central Illinois, you could go to a horse show on Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, within a 60 mile range. That's awesome. And, and at eight years old, I, I started showing. And I mean, yeah. that's all we did. Now, showing in those days, you were doing the all round. What were you doing? Yeah, you, you showed in the halter, the showmanship. And then when you got done with the halter classes, you put the saddle on and you did Western Pleasure, Trail, Barrels, Paul, you did it all. That's awesome. <laughs> you did it all. I kind of miss those days yeah. a little bit to where yeah. you had those truly all round horses. Oh yeah. And all round horsemanship too. Yes. We've lost some of that now. I we will say that with the, with the uh, specialization of every industry now, it's, it's raining, cutting, barrel racing, cow horse. Basically every industry now is such tough competition. Oh. You have to specialize. And in some ways it's good because it took the level way way up there but the, i think personally and you might have a different opinion we've lost some all-round great horsemen <laughs> great horsemen that mm -hmm. could do everything okay it'll sound stupid but i can't tell you how many people i know that have won millions of dollars in their sport they can't get a fucking horse on the horse trailer bobby without drugging it if yeah, they don't want to yeah. go on yeah. they don't get it they don't know how to get it on sure sure if it won't fucking stand still they drug it for the farrier they drug everything's drugs sure and we've lost that old school horseman where he didn't want to get in the trailer. You know, Tommy Mannion knew how to get in the trailer. You get what I'm trying to say? I, 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 I know agree. that's a silly example, but no. we've lost some of that all round horsemanship where they could start cults, deal with a problem horse, deal with a head shy horse, get it in the Western pleasure ring, take it out, put it in the, we've lost some all round horsemanship there with the specialization. Do you oh, oh, agree I, or I, disagree? I would, I, no, I would, totally, I would totally agree. And I think we would both land on the same spot that there's a handful of mm -hmm. true horsemen, yes. true horsemen. Yes, yes. 
that are and a true horseman is somebody that can care for a horse physically, yes, doctor sir. it, physically care for it, mentally take care of some yes, bitch, sir. and train it. Yes, sir. An all-round horseman. Yes, sir. Yes, because we all know there's certain trainers that can ride the hell out of one, but they won't doctor it, they won't take care of it, and if there's a problem, they don't know how to fix it. Exactly. We've also, especially in the reining world, we've got catch riders now that are really good at catch riding. That's all they do. They couldn't train a stick horse to lean up against a wall. But these motherfuckers can show one. You bet. They, If you get them a broke horse that knows its job, they are dangerous. No, you bet. But you they bet. couldn't train one. You know what I mean? So that's what I love about that. So you showed and did all the all-round stuff going through school, correct? Yes, yes. And, and, uh, and, you know, the great thing about the horse industry and showing like that, whether you're, you know, you're doing the reining, whatever discipline yep. you're doing, you know, you are thrust into a world of adults. Yes. And that's the great thing about the horse industry, yes. the horse, you know, showing horses, because you have the opportunity to learn. You learn how to compete. You learn mm -hmm. how to win. You learn how to lose. But you learn how to handle yourself. And be an adult. Yes. And be an adult. Yeah. And, and you're, you're years ahead of your peers. You are. Because of that experience. You are. And, and horses, horses will do it for a child. It did it for me like nothing else I'm aware of. Yes. I, I can identify that. So I left, when I left high school at 15, people can't believe my parents let me leave. And they not only let me leave, they encouraged me. But they were, you know, as we get older, we realize our parents are a lot damn smarter than what we thought they were. Oh, sure. You know, when well, we're a kid, we think they're the stupidest people in the world. But as we get older, we're like, they're and, the smartest son bitches I ever know. And you know what your kids are capable of. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. I had two daughters, yeah. Sydney and Caroline, and they each had a little different level of capability. Yeah. But I knew what it was. Yes. So when I left high school at 15, my parents encouraged me. But what people don't understand is when I left high school to go be a horse trainer, I was going out in the middle of nowhere in Rockhampton, Queensland with a 65 year old guy, Gordon McKinley. So I had to grow up real quick. Kind of what you're talking about. I went from being a kind of a goofy high school kid yep. at 15. I had to be a man pretty much overnight. Oh yeah. I had to work 14 hours a day, seven days a week. You hang around adults. There was no kids there. You adult conversation, adult this, adult that. Yes. So it taught me to wake up real quick and get educated real quick. And I loved it. And I remember I was there uh, for, for two years and a little part of me at that point always felt like maybe I'd miss some, miss some fun stuff in high school, the party years, prom, shit like that. I never forget this, Bobby. I went back to uh, my parents' place in Cairns in Queensland two years after I'd left high school. And I was walking through a mall and I, ran, I saw some guys that used to be buddies of mine, okay? Four or five of them sitting at a, at a table outside a fish and chip shop, okay? So I walk up to this guy that I used to be buddies with. I'd kind of lost contact after a couple of years. I'll never forget this. And I walked up to him, Bobby, and I said, hey, John, how are you? And I sh put my hand out to shake his hand. I never forgot this. He just looked at me. He looked at my hand. He looked up at me. He looked back at my hand. He didn't know how to shake a hand. Seriously, he did not know yep. that gesture. Yep. And I, he kind of left me hanging there for a few seconds and I'm like, this motherfucker's not gonna shake it. <laughs> yeah. And then he kind of half-heartedly, you know, gave me a wet limp wrist, fucking high, dead fish handshake. Sure. Made my skin crawl. And right at that moment, I looked him in the eye and I knew I'd become a man and he was still a boy. Yep. It was at that one moment. Yep. When I walked away, and, I, and then I said to him, well, John, what are you doing? Ah, oh, nothing. What are you, you going to college? Nah. What have you been doing? Oh, just partying. And I thought to my, when I walked away, I said, my parents are the smartest people in the world because I might've been that. Yeah. If I would've stayed in high school, I might've been sitting at that table with that kid at 17 rather than being pushed into the adult world yep. and learnt my trade and learnt my education. So you're, I could identify with that. I never regretted leaving school. After that moment, me thinking about, did I miss out on prom? Did I miss out on parties? It never crossed my mind ever again. Well, Clinton, I've had the same experience. I've gone home to my town of 700 people, McLean, Illinois, and there were kids that through school way smarter than me. Yeah. I mean, they were acing the test. The I wasn't. Mm -hmm. They they were great students. They were sharp. They were, you know, president of the the whatever club, and mm -hmm. and 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 I was off showing horses. But then you go back after you've graduated, and they've gone nowhere. Yeah. They're still in that hometown. That's exactly right. Yeah. Clinton's grabbing a cocktail and we'll be right back. Get yourself one and enjoy this short clip. Nothing would please them more than to see this old piece of shit in a coffin. 
Okay, here's our next hater. We've got Jonathan Gibson. Wow, F, this and F, that. Try to say two effing sentences without the F word. Is that a fucking challenge? Are you challenging me not to use the fucking F word? I accept your fucking challenge. Fucking idiot. <laughs> You know, Bobby, this will piss a few people off, but there's a reason why it's called Uncut and Real Raw, okay, <laughs> is I find in my life experience, the people that live where they were born and raised and never left have two things in common. They typically never financially get very far in life. They just kind of skate by financially. Yeah. They never make a shit ton of money. They never go do anything. And as a person, they never fucking grow. Yeah. I, every time I've moved locations, houses, I made more money. Yep. I think I got that from my parents. We must have moved eight times during my lifetime. And every time we moved, it was for a different business. Oh, yeah. Different real estate. Made more money. How Every time I moved in America, I made more money. So sometimes I, young people will walk up to me and say, you know, where I live is not a lot of economic growth. And I said, move. <laughs> well, I don't know how to do that. Well, fuck, I move countries. Figure it out. Figure it out. I came to America for $400. You can figure out how to move states. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're right. When people live and grow in the same town and never leave, they typically, two things, they never make a lot of money and they never grow as a human being that well. Now, I'm not saying they're bad people, so I wanna make that perfectly clear here, okay? But there's a, there's a tendency that they fit into that mold. Would you agree or disagree? Oh, absolutely. Well, think about this, after a 22 year career on the road working out of our hometown, my wife, Kelly and I, we made that decision to leave a fabulous situation. Yeah the home of our dreams, yeah. 10 acres in the country. Okay, my family was there, her family was there. And we made the decision we were gonna leave it all behind, move to Denver, Colorado for this opportunity. Mm -hmm. And God bless her, she has supported me in everything I've ever wanted to do in my life. Mm -hmm. And we did it yeah. and have never looked back. Yes. And we talk about it now, our quality of life, our income, our opportunities, we would have never, never had. That's never had. exactly right. You, you've got to, you've got to get out of your comfort zone. Absolutely. If you're not uncomfortable, you're not growing. Absolutely. Okay. So you get through high school. Do you go to college or not? Went, went to college. What did you study? Illinois State University, uh, accounting. Okay. And what was your goal at that point? Well, I, I, when I was showing horses, I traveled with a family. Their name was Striegel. Uh, the father, Gene Striegel, was a CPA. Mm -hmm. And he was a tough guy, but he was a good influence on me. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, his daughter's name was Stacy Striegel. Uh, showed a phenomenal mare known as Elisa Lark. Mm -hmm. Pleasure horse, was it? Pleasure horse. Right. Uh, Rugged Lark, yes. the famous stallion. There's a Briar Dodd, a uh, Briar yeah. uh, horse. horse. Yeah. Yep. Um, was it it's that one's mother? Yes. Oh, that was Rugged Lark's mother. Yes. It's going back a while now. Going back it? a ways, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Gene, you know, he's a CPA, and we'd go show horses, and he was a golfer. So I'd play golf with him and I'd meet his golf buddies and they were doctors and lawyers. And, you know, he constantly told me, Bobby, you don't want to be the horse trainer. You want to be the guy that hires the horse trainer. I love it. And I never, I never let go of that. Yeah. I never let go of that. You so remember those lessons. I, I do. And, and I was fortunate to be that kind of a kid mm -hmm. that I would find heroes. Mm -hmm. I would find those mentors that, mm -hmm. that I admired. I'd watch them, I'd listen to them, I would take their characteristics that I admired, yes. put it in my toolbox, yes. and, and I just, you know, much like you, and, and so you're always attracted to guys older than you, 20, yes. 25 years. I want to know yes. what they know. That's what I was the same way. Yes. I want to know what they know. I want to know what they do, why they do it, mm. how they do it. And, and when you go to these horse shows and you live in that world, you know, it's not a cheap hobby. No you've got to have some disposable income. Yes. So those families that are playing at that, yeah. they're successful at something. Yeah, they're not making their money in the horse industry, they're pissing it away there. Exactly, yes. exactly. So, so that's what got you, not to put words in your mouth, but that's what got you interested in not necessarily becoming a horse trainer, but be actually a businessman. Yes, sir. Or a corporate business, whatever you want to call it. Something, still want to be involved in the horses, I gather. Yeah, yeah. But not be the horse trainer. But not be, the, yeah, exactly. Okay. And, he always taught me that if there was somebody out there that did what you were going to do better than you, mm -hmm. hire them. Yes. Hire them. Yes. Okay. So 
I, while I was very talented with horses mm -hmm. back then, yes. I mean, it's out of my league now, yes. but back then I, I, I did well. Yes. I mean, I could have convinced myself I could have been a horse trainer, mm -hmm. but I, I wasn't convinced I was the best. Mm -hmm. And I'm unless I could have been in that arena feeling I was the best, yes. I didn't want to do it. I love that. I love that. You, you recognized a, a potential weakness in you and you turned it into a strength. Yeah. And you went a different direction. Yep. So you got through college. Was that hard to get through college? You hated school? I hated it. Hated, hated school, it. Yeah. And I, was, I, wasn't a, I wasn't a good reader. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. I mean, I tell people now, if I was the student then mm -hmm. that I am now. Good point. Oh my, I, yeah. who knows what I would have done. That's a good point. But the tools we have to learn with today mm -hmm. fit me. Yes. Reading a book didn't fit me. Yes. But I can watch videos of things I'm in. If I'm interested in it. You're passionate. Oh my God. Yes. And, and passion is the one word that I have in my favor and everything I've done. And if he has said, give me one word that's been the secret of your success, it's passion. That's right. Without that, it's just going through the motions. Exactly. If I could have, I, I felt the same way about school. I, I, I got through high school with a, a C at best, because yep. that's all I needed to do to keep my old man's foot out of my ass, yeah. was a C. Yeah. So I set the bar at a C. If I could have had the same passion for learning and ac academics the way that I did horses, I could have been pretty smart at it, but I never wanted to be at school. All I was dreaming about is getting home to a horse. Sure. All I dreamed about is training a horse. All I dreamed about is learning more about horses. To me, school was just an inconvenience yep. because it was stopping me from getting. I think that's why my parents let me go at 15 because they knew I wanted to be a horse trainer. They knew I was good at it. They knew I had a passion for it. And, and they saw that passion. And they saw that passion. You know what I mean? So you get out of, so let's say, you get out of college, were you able to show horses during college or not? Well, I, I, I had Or did a, you have to back that well, off? Well, I, I did back it off. I was probably about a sophomore and I was showing a, a little black reining horse. He was 14 hands tall, ebony power. Uh, qualified for the youth world that was in Tulsa at the time, uh, representing the state of Illinois. Mm -hmm. And uh, went out there on my own. I had a trainer back home, Brad Kelsaw. Mm -hmm. He was a mentor and, and helped me a lot. Uh, but I got to Tulsa, made the finals. I'm out there. I can remember like it was yesterday. I'm sitting on the fence and I'm watching these trainers on these horses sliding these things 15, 20, 25 mm. feet. And I'm sitting there going, what in the world am I doing here? <laughs> I'm out here by myself. Yeah. No trainer. Yeah. My little 14 hand yeah. <laughs> rain and horse. Yeah. And anyway, I go in and I show. Well, I know. I, let me tell you. Let me back up just a little bit. I was with Stacy Striegel. She was showing Elisa Lark. We go to Waco, Texas to the uh, uh, Texas Congress or something like that, okay? Mm -hmm. To show these horses, we're staying at Windward Stud, Frank Merrill's place, oh, yeah. but we go down there to Waco to show to get warmed up for the, for the youth world. And we ran AQHA pattern number five, which may not even exist now, mm -hmm. but here I am on my rainer. I'm a week and a half away from the youth world show. AQHA pattern number five, it was two and a half spins on the ends. I run him down there and slide him to a stop and go to do uh, my turn to the left, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> just dance <there>. nothing so <laughs> I called Brad and I said Brad I got a problem <laughs> I said here's what happened yeah he said we'll get back up there to Windward Stud and he says Frank will have some some blinders yeah and uh, <laughs> he said put those blinders on him and he says get him warmed up yeah and he says when you ask him to turn to the left get you a piece of what bailing wire yeah. make a little <laughs> make a little love it <laughs> he says ask him to turn to the left and you just smack him up there as hard as you can <laughs> They were, hoo, 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 hoo. <laughs> that son of a bitch was turning left. <laughs> Stopped him, did it to the right, same thing. And he said, now do not ask him to turn until you show him. That was the key. That was the key. Do not turn him until you show him. Uh -huh. So here my youth advisor standing at the arena and I go in there for the, for the first round and I am so mad because I just knew I overspun. Uh -huh. I just knew it. He turned so fast. But well, that's what I'm getting at. Did he turn? Oh. Oh, harder <laughs> and faster than he'd ever turned. And I knew I overspun. And I'm coming out of there and my youth advisor, he's going, yeah. You know, and I'm thinking, you stupid ass. You, I went off pattern. That's funny. So <laughs> what was the trick to, now the horse trainer part of me is coming in. What was the trick to the blinders so he didn't see it coming? Well, and you what, didn't hit him in the eye. Yeah, it wouldn't hurt his eye. It wouldn't hurt yeah, his eye. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't see it coming, yeah, it yeah. wouldn't hurt his eye. Yeah, so and, you could lay the neck rein. That was his cue, neck rein. Yeah. And then give him a couple of seconds and then yeah. whack him upside. Yeah. Yeah. And then he's not going to start turning when you just raise your hand to wave at somebody, you know. So. You know there's some fucking horse trainers right now writing this shit there. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, see, that's the kind of shit.
stories and shit that I was hoping to get out of you. It's just old school shit. Yeah. Like here's an example of shit. So my mentor, Gordon McKinley, he left school when he was 11. And that was very common back in those days. They didn't go to sure. school very long in Australia. You know, they had to turn into men quickly. And his job was to, to take a hundred head of wild horses and, and run them about 20 miles to a town to put them on railway carts to go away to the slaughterhouses. Mm -hmm. And these are wild horses. And I said, and he used to round them up. He, once they got rounded up, he would drive them to the, the railway station by himself, a hundred head too. And I said, well, how did you keep a hundred head from just galloping off like cats? He said, this is how we did it. He said, we would run them into a stock we would get an old leather boot, uh, just a leather punch. We would clip a hole in the tip of each ear. Then we'd get some old baling wire or baling string and we'd pull their ears down <laughs> and tie them down under their jaw. Well, tie them down like the opposite of a donkey, but sure. tie them down. And he said, when you let them out of the stock, they won't pick their head up more than six inches off the ground. And when a horse can't pick his head up more than six inches off the ground, he'll trot everywhere. So he said what it did is it stopped those horses from loping. So if they were at the trot, it was pretty easy just to round them up and keep them going in the wow. same direction. Yeah. That's shit you don't hear. You don't hear, yeah. That, he got 100 head of horses 20 miles with that little trick. And without that trick? You never would have got it done. And people might say today, well, that's fucking barbaric and how could you do that? Back in those days, it was survival. Yes. Back in those days, you had to do that shit to survive. Yep. You know, they used to pick up clean skin bulls. Clean skin bulls are bulls that are not branded, they're just wild. And okay. if you could capture them, it was yours by law. Sure. Well, these bulls are 10 years old, Brahmin bulls. They can jump over an eight foot high fence. And he said, how we used to keep these bulls from jumping in, out. Once we got them captured, your next battle was to stop them jumping a fence, okay? Yep. Yep. He said, we just used to get our pocket knife, run them through a stock. We'd get our pocket knife and right above their kneecap, we just slid them right there and you just cut the tendon. And he said, they'd knuckle over. If they went to yep. jump, they'd knuckle over. He said, they could still walk, they could still trot, but they couldn't jump. Now, in today's standards, people would say, oh my God, that's barbaric. But these bulls meant somebody was going to eat. Yeah. Capturing these bulls would mean a family could actually eat this year, not starve to death. Absolutely. So you could, you could poke fun of it and say that's barbaric. But a hundred years ago, things were pretty brutal. Oh. You had to survive. You know what I mean? And that's Absolutely. just, they are the stories that I love to talk about and hear. Yes. And yes. the blinders. So if you've got any more stories <laughs> like that. Fuck, I'm taking notes. Well, you know, you that's remember, the kind of shit well, I love. You remember I work for Tommy. Yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> See, if Tommy will come on, that's the same bitch that's I want it. on here. Okay. So so you spin, you overspin, but he spins like a legend. No, he did I didn't overspin. Oh, you didn't? No, I made the finals. I was setting fourth going into the finals. Oh, okay. Well, I yeah. thought you said you overspun. I thought I thought I did. Because he went so fast. He went so fast, I lost count. <laughs> I love so, it. So so I don't overspin. I made the finals and ended up 10th in the world. Oh, I love it. Yeah. That's awesome. Of, and there was like 165 rangers yeah. at the youth world back yeah. then. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And the, the finish to that story is I sold him, and the young boy that bought him come back the next year and won. That's awesome. That's awesome. Good, good. I love that story. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. This is what this podcast is about, is, is just sharing some shit that's uncut and real raw, and we can have a good laugh about oh, it yeah. and, and so forth. You know, yeah. you that was never, 1976. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I bet in 1976, had Frank Merrill completed Winwood Stud? Was it finished at that point? Oh, fabulous. Because it, it, it was just a palace, wasn't oh, it? Just, Back just. in its heyday, I didn't see it in its real heyday. Oh, oh. Nothing like it in the country. Nothing like it. Yeah. Nothing like it. And I was sitting in the motorhome that I drove all over the country uh, one night, and I'm eating a sandwich, and I look out the window, <clears throat> and Stacy's mom was out there talking to this guy. And I looked at him, and I thought, hey, he looks kind of familiar. So I just thought, oh, I'm going to go out there and see who that is. So I go out there, and it was Oren Mixer. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that name means anything. Oh, yeah. Oren Mixer, the painter. Yeah, he's the painter. Yeah. And uh, so that was a big deal. But again, yeah. again, as a youth, I got the opportunity to meet all these legends. That are all, all these, gone now. Yeah, yes. all these iconic individuals, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, I could remember, I lived in a little town, McLean, Illinois, and we had a truck stop, Dixie Truck Stop. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time in my life, I didn't think you could go anywhere in the world without going through the Dixie Truck Stop. <laughs> so my dad and I pull in there one day, and there's this horse van, this huge horse van, Tommy Mannion. Well, I'd never seen Tommy Mannion, but on the back page of the Quarter Horse Journal. Yeah. So I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to find Tommy. He's in that truck stop. Yeah. So I walk in there, and there he is on a payphone. Yeah. And I stood there and waited for him to get off that payphone. I walked up to him, Mr. Mannion, Bobby Smith. And shook good? his hand. Yeah. And what'd you say to him? I just said, I just admire you. I, I, I see your ads. Uh, I, I know you're in Springfield, Illinois, and I just, just wanted to meet you. 
that's good. And he was super, he was super cool. Yeah. Just yeah. super cool. Yeah. It's a pleasure. And that was Tommy. Yeah, that was Tommy. He had great people skills. Great people yeah. skills. Yeah. So moving forward now, you get out of college and what are you going to do? What, well, I, I, did you go back training horses? What, where, where did you go from college? Because I know at some point you worked for Tommy. So yeah. where are we with, from when you finished okay. college? Okay, well, I had, uh, and those were the days that I was working for Tommy. Okay, okay. so you're already working, for, you were working for Tommy going through high, uh, college? College, yeah, we'd go to the shows and he was hauling a Lisa Lark for the Striegels. That, okay, it's coming back to me. Wasn't he from Illinois? Springfield. Okay, so he was from your home state. Yeah, yeah. That's how you made the connection. Yeah, too. I lived, lived 50 miles away. Yes, yeah. okay. So I primarily worked for him on the road. So the summer that I met Doug and Doug come to work for Tommy, I was going to go to the Iowa circuit. Mm -hmm. Tommy had called me and says, hey, I need your help. Go to the Iowa circuit with me. So I go down there three or four days ahead of leaving for the Iowa circuit. So just back up, this is back in the days when Tommy's doing pleasure horses, halter horses, all round horses, the whole thing. The whole not, thing. not in cutters no. like he is now. Just no, no, no. Round. Yeah, no, no. This was, he was doing the all around thing and uh, and doing it well. and Probably the best in the business. At that, be best, that best, best in the business without a doubt. A showman. To the nth degree? Showman to the nth degree. What did he have that nobody else could duplicate, or, or, or what did he have that nobody else was doing at the time? What made him stand out? He was extremely smart. Mm -hmm. You know, Tommy was always looking for the advantage. Yeah. And it didn't matter how little that detail was. Mm -hmm. I mean, he sweat the details. Yes. Sweat the details. Yes. Studied it, but a showman. I mean, I can remember, you know, watching him. He'd be, back then, he'd be showing in a pleasure class. And you'd see Tommy, Tommy turn around like this to look behind him. Well, he wasn't looking behind him. He was collecting his horse. Mm -hmm. When he turned around, his hand went up. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, so he, he had these tricks and these distractions and these things that he would do to get a result he wanted. So he could slow his horse down a little bit or collect him up and the judge thought he was looking at who was behind him. Exactly. That's cool. Yeah, I, I know Tommy not well by any means, but but I want to get him on the podcast. Uh, you've, you've inspired me now to call him up and say, oh. hey, get your ass up here because he's got a wealth of, that's why I'm writing a book right now about Doug's life, as you know, because I don't want all this information lost. Sure. About Doug's life, but not only that, the way that Doug picked horses, you know, sure. the, day, the way that he bought, sold, and picked horses in confirmation. I don't want that information well, and lost. We're, and and we're, sort of, we're, we're sort of at a point in our life where that bridge to that old knowledge in is going is going. You're right about that. Okay. Yeah. And Tommy's and, gen, Tommy's age, it'd be about the end of it, wouldn't it? Yeah. He'd be about the oldest that's still kicking, correct? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you've got all the busters gone. You've got all all the uh, other guys that were yeah. like him, and that age group are all dying. Now, yeah. Yeah. Dead. You know, back then, you know, it was Tommy, Jerry Wells, Dave Page, Ted Turner. Yes. Those guys. You know, you pull into Iowa, and it was the legends of the legends. Yeah. And, and see what was cool to me about when they trained horses, all those guys, there wasn't the drugs like there is now. They no. had to train the some bitches. Oh yeah. They had to get inside their head. Oh yeah. They had to get these horses doing things and they couldn't rely on drugs to make it happen. No, no. And we were dragging railroad ties to get them to use their ass in. Yes. Yeah, Doug told me a funny story about that. We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> so, so you met Doug and what year would it have been when Doug 1976. Carpenter? So Doug told me that when he was a kid, Two things, being a horse trainer was cool. Like mm -hmm. if you were gonna be a horse trainer, it was kind of like a cool profession. Oh yeah. Back in those days. So oh, yeah. what would we have been talking late 70s? Like, mid to late 70s. Mid to late 70s. And he specifically told me, he said, Clinton, being a horse trainer back in those days was cool. Oh yeah. And he said, Tommy Mannion was the man that there was a two year waiting list to get in to work for him. Oh, oh. Two years. And, and it was like, and if you work for Tommy, it was like, you're a rock star. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I mean, you could pretty, if you did a good job for him for two or three years, you could write your ticket where you wanted to go. Exactly. Yeah. If you had that connection, that affiliation. And worked your ass off. And learned. worked your ass. Oh my God. Yeah. He'd come into the barn, 1130 midnight, and he would rattle off. Okay, boys, you know, do this, 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 and then go home. Yeah. And he'd leave and you'd stop. He just gave us two and a half hours work. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and yeah. we loved Every, Every bit of minute. it. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, mm -hmm. it's funny because when Doug said back in those days it was cool to be a horse trainer, and before he passed, he said to me, being a horse trainer, it didn't, ha it's lost some of that coolness. Mm -hmm. Well, did you see the American? Were you at the American? Uh, no, we, we the I was American in Scottsdale at the Sun horse. Circuit, but we had a watch party and we watched okay, it. Okay, yeah. I watched it too. I had yep. a tour in Virginia. Yep. But I was watching that and I got a little sad halfway through it because I thought, how cool would Doug have thought this was? Oh yeah. 
because to have the American televised and have the top best, five best cutters, five best rainers, five best cow horses in front of 20,000 people nationally televised with that kind of production that Teton did, I just, I said, I said to myself, man, if Doug was here, he'd be just so proud of where this has gone because it's made horse training cool again. Yes. It's, I bet there was a lot of kids in that audience that were like, I'm going to be a cutting horse trainer. Oh. I want to be a reining horse oh. trainer. It, it got to be cool again where we'd you, lost that for a you while. You cannot measure what that's done for the horse industry. Yeah. You can't. You cannot measure the yeah. impact that that's had. Yeah. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Okay. So when you met Doug in that time, um, you two kind of hit it off straight away? Oh. And, and I mean, a lot of people, if you knew him well, you knew his sense of humor. Yes. Yeah. He loved to laugh. Yeah, he did. He always cracking jokes. And I'm telling you, fun. Yeah. Almost illegal how much fun we had. <laughs> for, for, you should have been paying Tommy, let alone Tommy paying you. <laughs> well, and that's kind of how it went. You know, you'd work for Tommy. If you needed money, he'd give you money. And you're on the road for three weeks and you have worked your ass off. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You've been up 24 hours. And, and so you get home and he calls you into the office and he'll say, Bobby, what do I owe you? You've just had the time of your life. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I would. I'd literally pay you to do that again. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> so, you know, the guy was sharp. He was smart, yeah. you know. And, oh, man, when you're, when you're that age and you're working for Tommy, I mean, the girls wanted to know you. Oh, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> and that was, a big, that was a big part of it. I love it. it. Just, yeah. So, in that period when you were really running, uh, running and gunning with Tommy, if you could name the top, you mentioned one of them as the attention to detail, but for you personally, what were the life lessons that you think you took away from that, that sector? I've never- That time, a period of life, if you said, okay, the going back on it now, I've really got an advantage in these three areas or, or took away these things. Tommy was the quintessential people person. Mm -hmm. The lesson I took from him was, you know, learn their name, use their name, I mean, he, he yeah. was a master. Yeah. He was a master. And, and he always had time to talk to you. And he, would, he knew the entire family. He knew the story. He knew the history. I was never around anyone that could handle people like Tommy Mannion could handle people. He had great people skills. Right? Great, phenomenal. And he would, he, he would tell you, he studied it. Mm -hmm. He made a point. There was no accident. Mm -hmm. But he understood the importance. My mother always used to tell me, she said, people either got people's skills or they don't. Yep. And I think she's right and wrong. I agree with her most of the, in the fact that I think people, like I've naturally got people's skills as far as ability to talk, bullshit, gift of the gab, etc. Yep. yep. But I have seen, I've had some students over the years that were introverted people, girls, mm -hmm. but with enough studying and enough trying, they could be extroverted yep. and they could have phenomenal people skills, yep. but they had to, what you said, work at it, learn it. Oh yeah. You know, you know, the old book, How to Win Friends and Influence People should be something that every high school kid is made to read oh. you know dale carnegie even though it was written 100 years ago to this day it's right to the point oh yeah and and and, and the, 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 again the details you know if if he told you to go get a horse out to show somebody you know you didn't just put a nylon halter yeah right? you went and got a show halter yeah everything was a presentation wasn't it everything was presentation <laughs> you only everything. got one chance at first impression oh a absolutely and i that I kept that at my entire life because mm -hmm. that with what i have done throughout my career yes presentation is everything yes one thing, you know, you're always well, well dressed. You've always got your shit together and you're well dressed. You've always got a smile on your face. You're always shaking somebody's hand. Yeah. That's important. Yeah. And you learned those lessons way early on. Way early on. Mm -hmm. Way early on. And the importance of that and, and just the impact that it had on people. Mm -hmm. I mean, people wanted to be around him. Yeah. He was charismatic. Oh, yeah. just, just the best. Yeah. 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 So at what point did you say, I want to quit? Did it, did, working for Tommy when it was so good, did you get a little bit of a bug that maybe you wanted to go back and be a horse trainer oh, sure. or you still felt you, like? You could not not get that bug. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was hard not to. Mm -hmm. uh, but back home, uh, I was working at a Western store and I always loved retail. Yep. I always loved the clothing business. Yes. Had a passion for that, mm -hmm. okay? So um, of course, met my wife, Kelly, we were dating. Uh, very serious about, mm -hmm. you know, uh, our relationship mm -hmm. uh, and a great girl. I mean, mm -hmm. my God, been 42 years. It's awesome. Yeah. And it supported me uh, through, everything. <laughs> through everything, yeah. everything. And uh, anyway, long story short, uh, we ended up buying this Western store. My dad farmed, her dad farmed. Farming was good. Mm. 
when we started this deal. And then that was the early 80s. Mm -hmm. And you may not even be old enough to remember this, but you know, uh, the economy took, took a, a dump. Yep, yep. Interest rates went to 20%. Mm -hmm. Farming got hard. Farming, the, the farm ground in McLean, Illinois, got to be worth $7,500 an acre, which was the most expensive land in the country. Yeah. It was like overnight, that went away. Yeah. It went down. You couldn't sell it if you wanted to. Yeah. So uh, the economy just fell apart totally. So that required us all to regroup, retool, and uh, Bobby needed to find a job. Mm -hmm. uh, Kelly and I... So you quit the Western store at that point? Yes. Because it was just going broke? Well, yeah, we just had to, well, we had to pull our horns yeah. in. You know, we'd lost a lot of our collateral. Yes. Because farm value, land yeah, had gone down. Good point. You know, and, la and the farming was what we wanted to maintain and mm. keep. So we pieced that together the best we could with the times and mm. the economy and all of that. And, uh, but it gave me the opportunity to meet uh, people that owned a company out of Northern Indiana by the name of Sheets Brothers. Mm -hmm and they were a fabulous distributor of horse healthcare products, mm -hmm. uh, Absorbing, Farnham and all mm -hmm. of that. They did light manufacturing of harness leather and head stalls and such, and I had a great relationship with them. And um, this, own, the owner's son called me one day and asked me what I was gonna be doing. And I said, well, in a perfect world, I'd like to work for a company like Sheets Brothers. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, what do you wanna do? And I said, well, I think I'd like to go on the road. And he said, why don't you come over and let's have a conversation. Well, let's stop it right there. Okay. We got to get a fresh cocktail and change batteries. But the point is, he called you up and he said, I want to meet you. Yes. Correct? Let's, let's remember the story. Let's grab another okay. cocktail, Bobby. Okay. I'm loving this, mate. Loving it. <laughs> Are we, is this? It's perfect. <laughs> it's just it's just a couple of guys bullshit and I love it. <laughs> Clinton's grabbing a cocktail and we'll be right back. Get yourself one and enjoy this short clip. How do you know what it takes to become successful? Talk to someone who's done it. Clinton Anderson became a multimillionaire by leveraging his passion for horse training into a global brand and media empire, starting with nothing but the change in his pocket and the will to succeed. In doing so, he revolutionized an industry and became a celebrity. Now, you can put his experience and advice to work for your business. With Clinton Anderson's business consultancy, you can tap into Clinton's unique perspective Hear his straight talk and get his no-nonsense advice. Just imagine yourself armed with Clinton's hard-earned knowledge and entrepreneurial spirit. So whether you own a ranch or any sort of business at all, we invite you to discover the transformative power of Clinton Anderson's leadership and innovation in your business. Call 1-888-287-7432 to take your business to the next level today. So, Bobby, we're freshening up a cocktail, and you were saying that the Shoots Brothers gentleman, what was his name? Uh, Mitch. Mitch. Mm -hmm. He gave you a call and said, let's go meet. Yes. Okay, yes. what happened? So, uh, Kelly and I drive to North Manchester, Indiana, and uh, we spend the day with him. And um, hit it off great, liked the idea of what could happen mm -hmm. with this new relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, so, they gave me... Indiana, Illinois, and Michigan. And what were their main products again? Because they had the leather scrap goods, didn't they? They did, but we at the time were fairly sizable distributors for all the Absorbing okay. and Farnham healthcare okay. items. But back in those days, Farnham was huge, wasn't it? Huge. Because it was everywhere. Oh, everywhere. And, and it seemed like they disappeared for quite a few years, yep. and I noticed them coming back again now. Yes. Is that right? They're coming yes. back again now. Yes. I don't know if somebody rebuilt the brand well, or and what you know, happened there. I always said Farnham was really, they had, they, they're, their widget was horse healthcare items, uh -huh. but they were a marketing company. Yes. That was yep. their deal. They were mm -hmm. a marketing company and uh, quite successful, mm -hmm. huge, and it was everywhere. Mm. So we were distributors for all of their products. Okay. So were the leather goods kind of a side gig yes. a little bit? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I, and, I used to sell Shoots Brothers in the early years before I got hooked up with Martin and Equibrand. Yes. And they had phenomenal products. Oh, oh. The, the best we, quality. We uh, hand cut Herman Oak. Yep. Uh, harness leather, best harness leather reins in the oh, industry, yeah. and uh, phenomenal. But in that territory that I had, and here, here's, this is so critical and critically important to mm -hmm. my foundation mm -hmm. and my ongoing success. Mm -hmm. If you called them before noon on any given day and, get, and placed an order with them, and you lived in that three-state area, you had it the next morning. Yeah. UPS would drop it off. Mm -hmm. So what going to work for them on the road allowed me to do was meet every customer in that territory. Mm -hmm. 
travel it for five years and build that reputation, build those relationships. Yeah. And I was able to do it with a company that was very reliable, very well respected, and, and it- Easy got, to rep. Easy to rep. Yeah. I always say this, people do business off relationships first. Oh. Sure, you've got to have a price point, yep. and you've got to deliver the goods. But if you're a little bit sloppy on, on price point, but you still deliver the goods, relationships will go a long way. And I'll tell you the other- You know what I'm trying to I, say. It's, it's, it's critically important, and it's, it's the foundation and it's everything. The other very, very important lesson that I learned with this experience was product knowledge. Mm -hmm. Product knowledge adds value mm -hmm. that you can't even measure. Yeah. I'll never forget, I went on an Easter weekend, I went to Columbus, Ohio, I didn't even cover Ohio, but Rod's Western Palace was having this big Easter weekend. Mm -hmm. Was Rod's big in that day, even back then? For, for, for what they were and Because they we got were. huge now, yeah, yeah. a huge now. Yeah, yeah, but relatively speaking, yes. Yes, okay. And I met a bit maker there by the name of Greg Dutton. Mm -hmm. And Greg Dutton gave a little bit seminar. Mm -hmm. And he taught me how to take any bit, any bit, you hand me a bit, and I can take that bit and I can balance it on my fingers and I can tell you the nerves in the mouth that that bit is gonna affect. Mm -hmm. Palate pressure, tongue pressure, shank. And I was mesmerized by that. But, but that experience, I realized product knowledge is key, it adds value. And for the rest of my career and even to this day, I apply what I call my bit theory mm -hmm. analysis. Be a product expert. Be a product expert. Yeah. Know it inside now. Inside now. If you can't explain it to a six-year-old mm -hmm. in a way they can understand it, you don't yeah. understand it. Yeah. What is the feature and what is the benefit? Yes. What is the? This is the feature. This is the benefit. This is the feature. This is the benefit. Yep. Yes. Exactly. So how many years? Did, well, first of all, when you're repping on the road like that, help me understand how many miles are you doing a year in a truck or car, or uh, you got a van? How are you taking this product around? I started in a in a in a Buick Century that I leased. Uh, fifty thousand miles. Fifty thousand miles. Fifty thousand okay. miles would be right on it. Yes. Okay. Are you home every night? Are you got to stay in a lot of oh, hotel no, rooms? Oh no, no, a lot of hotels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, gone, gone all the time. So Monday through Friday, you're kind yep. of away from the family, and yep. you're back on Friday night. Yes, yes, and. You know, I would, I'd be up at four o'clock in the morning, on the road, hot cup of coffee. A lot of times I didn't even know where I was going, but I went. Truly. So I, I was star. I was so star back in those days, this is long before the internet, oh, long before oh. MapQuest. There weren't even, fa there weren't even <laughs> fax machines. <laughs> No, you had, you had fucking I had a map. You had pigeons. You just was, tie a note to a pigeon's leg was, and kick that some bitch out of the car to get a message back my, home. My Rand McNally <laughs> map. No. And and I learned that you get outside of the the, the Detroit proper and it's gravel roads in Michigan. I mean oh, gravel funny. roads. Oh yeah. No. So I, you know how to read a map well. I've I've been lost. Most <laughs> most most young people now wouldn't know what a map nope. is. They wouldn't know how to start a do fire they, with do a map. Do they even have maps? They still do. do they? I keep them in the trucks. All my vehicles have big Atlas maps yep. in them, just on the off chance and so forth. You know what yep. I mean? That internet's not working or MapQuest or whatever the fuck it is and Apple Maps. So um, you're basically going to stores and saying, what do you need? Yep. What do you need more of? What do you need yep. to reorder? Well, I learned, I learned about, you know, restocking, uh, turning inventory, replenishment. Uh, turn is a function of replenishment. Yeah. You know, and I would teach those retailers, you know, when you run out, we got to fill in. Yeah. You've got to have that product. You know, yeah. you go to your, you go to your grocery store two or three times in a row and they don't have milk and eggs. You're looking for a new grocery That's store. That's a good point. So yeah. don't, don't send them down the road to the competition. Yeah. If you want to win this battle, keep your inventory. Awesome. If, you, if you can't afford to stock three different fly sprays, by God, pick the best one and stock it. Was there any sales courses that you took as a young man to help you sell and become a good salesman? <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say? Well, like, I know, you know. We mentioned Dale Carnegie was a great book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And, and you've got other great salesmen over the years that yep. have put out material. Did you ever study any of that? Oh God. Or did okay. anybody help you? Well, okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna skip ahead mm -hmm. about five years. Okay. And this was when I had become a multi-line rep. Okay. Okay, so I've got Sheets Brothers, and I took on Roper Apparel, Carmen mm -hmm. out of Denver, uh, what I built into a great clothing line before I got Cinch. And um, I was repping, oh, a couple of other lines, I can't even remember what they were, but I had about four lines, okay? Mm -hmm. And my peers and people I thought were my friends, I could hear the chatter behind me. Mm -hmm. He can't do all that. Yeah. 
Nobody can do all that. Because yeah. everybody else that was traveling the road had one line. Yeah. You know, there was a Justin boot rep, there was a Tony Lama boot rep. Nobody had nobody had two lines, let alone four. Yeah, yeah, and here yeah. I am with four. So, you know, every now and then it'd get in my head and I'm like, well, maybe I can't do this. So I discover Zig Ziglar. Yes. I've listened to all his shit. I love it. I, I have ev had every tape, every program he ever put out. Yes. I'd be in my Buick I love at 4 o'clock in the morning, Learning shove something. the cassette in. Yeah. That's when you had cassette oh, tapes. Oh, yeah. Okay? And I mean, I, by the time I got to my first appointment on Monday morning, I could bite nails in two. He was a contagious son of a bitch, wasn't oh. he? When you listen to his shit, if you didn't have a hard on and want to go sell something, <laughs> I don't know what did it. You didn't draw he, breath. Yeah, damn right. He was a, yes, I've got all his stuff. I mean, yes. so, so, so to answer your question, yeah. yes, I did that for six years. See, knowledge is power. You were driving anyway. Yes. Mo might as well go learn something. And I did. Yes. And uh, Sydney, my youngest daughter, when she was six years old, somebody would say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she'd say, a motivational speaker. I love it. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you what, there was a time when Zig Ziglar could have called in sick. I could recite every program he ever presented. Because you listened Perfect. and you listened. Repetition, 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 repetition. Yes. You could say the word that was going to come out of his mouth because yes. you listened to it so much. So much. That's key to it is I over wore, and over and over I again. wore those tapes out. But you know, it got me through that point of doubt. Very much so. So you, you said it's something key there, and I don't know if you really realize you did it. When people were chattering, you said a key word. They were chattering behind you. When people are trash talking you, they're behind you for a fucking reason. <laughs> Seriously. No, you're when right. people are talking shit about you, they're behind you. Yeah. Ian Francis, another one of my mentors, he always says about, you know, at the horse show, I always asked him, I said, well, Ian, how did you know when it, because Ian's won the Rain and Fertility in Australia five times, the Cut and Fertility in Australia th uh, three times. He's one of the last all-round, he's retired now, but great all-round horse trainers on a, on a high level that could do it all. And I asked him one day, I said, well, how did you know when it was time to change a style or change a technique to, to win? And he said it was simple. He said, so back in Australia, it kind of in the old days, and you'd remember this, you know, you'd win and you'd have to go to the secretary's box to get your check. Right. You know what I mean? So yeah. you'd win the event. At the end of the day, you go get your check and your ribbon or whatever the fuck it was, and you go to the secretary's box. So you, or Ian always used to put things in funny little sayings. And he always said, when I get to the secretary's box... If I'm looking at the back of somebody's head, it means I need to make a change, which means when somebody's in front of me and I got second or third, I'm going to ask myself, do I need to start making some changes to the program? He said, when I get to the secretary's box and I'm not looking at the back of somebody's head, meaning he's first, I don't make any changes. People chat behind you. Yep. They're, they're behind you for a reason. Yep. And they kind of fuck with your head for a little bit by yep. the sounds of it. But yep. then you kept moving forward, didn't yep. you? You kept moving forward. Yep. You kept moving forward. Yep. And you blew them out of the water. Well, and, and, and always had the, uh, and I think this was the life experience of, you know, being around guys like Tommy Mannion. And it's like, you know what? You, you don't, you, you find a way. Yes. You find a way to get past that. When you want something bad enough, you'll find a way. And when you don't, you'll find an excuse. Ian Francis mentor he, that's on the bottom of every one of my emails yep. his famous saying i want this put on my gravestone when yeah. i die i want it to say my name and how long i was alive and the next thing i want edged in there is his famous saying when you want something bad enough you'll find a way you, you find and a way. if you don't you'll find an excuse yep ian francis yep you live by that that's what you did you found a fucking way yep no um, and one of the best compliments I ever got from anybody was uh, when I took Lucchese and Doug Kendi, still a dear, dear friend of mine today, president. Uh, he was a sales manager and uh, Paul Lavoie was president. And, um, and Paul called Doug and says, you need to hire Bobby Smith for that territory. Yeah. And Doug said, well, he's got all these other lines and da, da, da. And Paul Lavoie said, I'd rather have half of Bobby Smith yeah. than all of anybody else. Yes. Yes. I've never forgot it. Yes. I've thanked him. I've thanked him for it. I've wore Lucchese for years. Great boot too. Oh yeah. Very good boot. Very good. Very, Very good, good for the industry. And great people. And great people. That's exactly right. Yep. I love what you said. You know, knowledge is power. You were on the road, you were selling, but you, you, you that's the cool thing about America is whatever you want to know or whatever you want to learn, somebody's got what you want. Just find them and negotiate a price. Well, find them and negotiate a price. And you can get what they have, whether it's education through, you know, the cassette tapes or DVDs or streaming now or connections. It, it, somebody's got what you want. Absolutely. Just locate who's got it, negotiate a price, and make it happen. And Zig Ziglar's benchmark phrase was, help enough other people get what they want, mm -hmm. and you can have anything 
you, you want. want in life. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and see the stuff that Zig Ziglar's doing and did in Dale Carnegie, would you not agree it's still timeless today? Timeless. It, you could still, doesn't matter what you're selling, it's still 50, timeless. 60 years later, it's still good shit. If somebody in their 20s come to me today and said, hey, I'm gonna start this repping job or this sales job, what advice can you give me? I'd say here. Yeah. Listen to these for yeah. the next five years. Yes. Put your head down. Yes. And don't look up. Yes, don't look up. Yes. Yes. Work your ass off. Yes, yeah. It's a, it's a, there's a little quote that I always used to love and it kind of twigged my brain when you said don't look up, which means work your ass yes, off. Yes, yes. It says, when you quit looking at the time, eventually you quit looking at the price tag. <laughs> that pisses it's, some it's, people off. But it's true. I don't look at the price tag no. when I buy anything anymore. No. But there's a reason for that because I never used to look at the fucking clock. clock. Yep. For oh, yeah. about 25 years, oh, I didn't look at the clock. No. When you quit looking at the clock, which means head down, yep. ass up, work your butt off, yeah. especially that 20 to 30s. Yes. They're your energizer bunny, aren't you? Oh. That's the year, that's the decade to get your shit together. When you will put your head down, ass up, and work like a Trojan that decade, oh. eventually, you don't have to look at the price tag of what nope. you want to buy. But nope. if you keep looking at the clock, you'll always look at the price tag. Oh, over the years, so many people, I want to do what you do. Yeah. I want to do what you do. How do I do what you do? Uh, hey, you just work your ass off. Work your ass off. You know, the reps that didn't make it, the reps that weren't successful, I don't even have to see what they were doing. If they weren't successful, they didn't work. That's right. That's exactly right. Awesome. So how long did you do those repping jobs for? Five years, 10 Five what years? Age, what, age, did, what age are you now when you're in the middle of that and you've got all these lines? Yeah, there? I did. Um, you I mid-20s, did, I did, late I did, 20s? I did, let's see. Uh, yeah, late 20s. I did Sheets Brothers for five years exclusive mm -hmm. and was making a living but wasn't making any money. Yes. And uh, I went to Sheets Brothers and I said, hey, mm -hmm. I love you. I love this. But if I'm going to spend this time of time away from my family and make this sort of yeah. dedication, I need to make some money. Yeah. I would like for you guys to consider giving me the opportunity to go find a non-competing line. I love it. To put in my package. Yes. To, and they said, absolutely. Yeah. But I mean, I had worked my ass That's off. That's right. You proved I, loyalty. I proved, yeah. I had equity with them. Yes. Yes. And, um, you, and didn't, you didn't do this after six months, Bobby. You did it after five years. Five years. And they didn't give me any trouble. Right. That's what kids now don't understand is they think six months in a new job, you should be fucking president. <laughs> yeah, right. You know what I mean? Five yeah. years you I went do. to them and, they, and that was the next, but in that five years, I don't want to put words into your mouth, you learned the business. Oh, learned the business, learned the trade, built the relationships. Honed your skills. Honed my skills. I mean, at that point, I had dealers. They didn't want to see the, oh, Bobby, just keep me in business. They don't want to see the price. They don't want to see an invoice. They just want the product there. Don't have to leave me an order copy. Yeah. Keep me it. in business. Yeah. I, I, they gave it to me. They gave me their business. You did the apprenticeship, didn't you? That five years was basically your, where you cut your teeth, correct? I, I, absolutely. And the other important piece I, I learned and developed during that is if you will take the, the uh, mundane, difficult, boring, pain in the ass job away from somebody mm -hmm. and do it for them, mm -hmm. they will gladly let you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you'll get paid to do it. Yeah, yeah. Give me an example of that. Well, uh, Donnie Henselmeyer, Henselmeyer, South Indianapolis, took me to his shirt wall one day. And I mean, solid basic shirts from size 14 and a half to size 20. 10 colors, big business, huge. Mm -hmm. Donnie said, this is yours. Don't ever let me be out. Yeah. But don't ever abuse it. Yeah. Because the same hand that gives this business to you can take it away. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Good so, deal. So, and, and, and um, uh, Bill Patterson, Tack Room uh, in St. Louis, Missouri, they sold Wonder Blue shampoo <laughs> to the Budweiser Clydesdales. Clydesdales. Yeah. He took me down the basement. We had two huge shelves full of Wonder Blue gallons of shampoo. Bobby, don't ever let me be out. <laughs> when Budweiser comes here for shampoo, I want to have shampoo. That's awesome. So you take on the new lines. Yes. Was it hard for you to get the new lines? You knew what you wanted? Were people already Well, no, I, I, Well, I'll tell you what, it, it, just about a, a week after I'd had that conversation with Sheets Brothers to get permission to go out there and find another line, I'm out mowing the yard mm. on, on a Saturday morning, 
and uh, Kelly, my wife, comes out and she's uh, got a piece of paper in her hand. And uh, a gentleman by the name of Bill Monfort, he was working for Tony Lama, and he'd carried Tony Lama in Roper Apparel. Mm. And uh, she said, Bill called, he's recommending you to take this line. You're gonna stop mowing, you're gonna go call him, and you're gonna take this line. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, well, I'm not sure I wanna, you're gonna take this. <laughs> so, so long story short, I took it. It was shipping about 350,000 a year. Mm -hmm. So I took it, as luck would have it, a gentleman by the name of Garth Brooks <laughs> started to sing. Yeah. Okay. He wore these border stripe shirts. Yes. <laughs> I've got photos of me wearing them. I'm embarrassed, but I've got photos of me wearing them. Okay, it was an era, okay? Yes. It was an era. I, you know what? Let's blame all the son of a bitches. Instead of me taking all the guilty blame, everybody that was alive then, you all son of a bitches, you all did it. Lady, ladies had the pants up to their nipples. We're all in it together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the old Rockies that came up to their nipples. <laughs> so I took that line, shipping $350,000 in two years. I was shipping two million dollars of Roper apparel I think two or three years in a row I had the largest increase in the sales territory one sales contest after sales contest so I was it just dumb luck that and I don't mean this disrespectfully but was it a little bit of dumb luck that that Garth was wearing your shit was he was he sponsored by Roper no was it just dumb luck that well, he's disliked their shirts you know what I'm trying yeah, to say no no it, and, 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 I, and, and in his early days he was just sort of wearing whatever he liked yeah because he was just trying to get yeah, famous yeah. yeah and and we never had a deal with Garth but he eventually got to the point where he had that good friend that made the Mo Betta shirts you remember the Mo Betta yeah, shirts yeah I do and remember that brand yeah he, 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 he wore those but um, we we just had we just had styles that clicked, and the Western industry very much what we're going through now with Yellowstone and stuff. Mm. That was Urban Cowboy was probably yes. seven years prior. So we're talking early we're talking early eighties. Um, when was when was eighties early nineties? Early nineties now. Okay, er, we're in the early nineties. Yeah, and um, and and Garth is a sensation. Western wear and the old Western lifestyle has a big huge yes. boom, very much like what we're enjoying right now yes. with the Yellowstone phenomenon. And, and such. So, you know, throughout my career, I've actually witnessed three of those. Mm -hmm. And I would tell you before that, if you were lucky enough to witness one of them, yes. you had a good life. Yes. And I've lived through three of them. That's awesome. Yeah. Today's episode was filmed and produced by Intercut Productions, marketing by Stuart and Associates, and organized and administrated by Down Under Horsemanship. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to hit the subscribe button and leave a rating. Follow us and stay up to date on social media, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. See you next time, mate. Cheers.